Well, welcome to 10 Minute Record Reviews, episode 357. And this time I'm going to talk about this record by, well, a bunch of folks actually John Lewis, Percy Heath, Bill Perkins, Chico Hamilton, and Jim Hall put out on Pacific in 1956 called either Two Degrees East, Three Degrees West, or The Grand Encounter, depending on which particular release you're dealing with. And what I have is a Japanese pressing from that same year of release. This is a very well-known record, or at least a much lauded record, which in theory is an experiment in bringing together West Coast players who were associated with the cool school with East Coast jazz man, a formula which would later on lead to great records like Sonny Rollins' Way Out West. But to describe it that way is kind of false advertising because thinking about the East Coast players, and in particular John Lewis, who's the major influence in this record, he is no hard bopping late night club lord. He is very much a cerebral and classically influenced force behind later on some third stream jazz. And the West Coast players are not so much chilled out session dudes as they are people who themselves were experimenting in something that was quite classically infused through the Chico Hamilton Quintet, music which was sometimes called chamber jazz. So this quintet pretty much has the genes to offer up what we could expect to be a very mellow record. The question is, does this quintet shake off their classical bent enough to have this impromptu recording sound fresh and energetic? That's what we'll discuss. John Lewis is probably best remembered, well, is best remembered for being the driving force and the leader behind the modern jazz quartet. But unusually for a jazz legend, He's a guy who grew up far from the jazz mothership. He grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and most of his background and his upbringing in musical training was in classical music. When the war came in 1942, he joined the army, and there his service was like a lot of other musicians during World War II, and that most of his service was in army bands. And in his particular band, he happened to meet up with the brilliant jazz drummer Kenny Clark, who in future years would do so much, along with Max Roach, to define bebop drumming. Clark tried to persuade Lewis that his future lay not in classical music, but in jazz and in New York City. And when the end of the war came, Lewis takes his advice, at least for the most part. He moved to the big city, but he was not quite ready to let the whole classical thing go yet. So he enrolls under the GI Bill at the Manhattan School of Music, eventually earning his master's degree. But he also gets involved right away in the early bebop scene, becoming involved in playing with Dizzy Gillespie. And he brings some compositions to Dizzy, including the song Two Bass Hit, which becomes a huge hit for Gillespie early on. He worked in Dizzy's band for a couple of years, including touring Europe, and in that band he makes some strong musical friendships which would bear real fruit in the years to come. In 1948, he leaves Dizzy to go out on his own as a session guy and accompanist, and he ends up playing with people like Lester Young and Ella Fitzgerald and Charlie Parker, with whom he makes a number of recordings. He also falls in with the whole scene around Miles Davis and Gil Evans, that whole group which was forging a path away from bebop towards something less bebop-ish. And his involvement with that ends up being immortalized on the famous Birth of the Cool sessions led by Davis and Evans, which feature four different tracks arranged by Lewis. But as important as Lewis's contributions were to that particular project and other projects, it's the friendships he'd made back in Dizzy's band with several other musicians, which ended up being much more determinative of his career in the 1950s. And those musicians were Milt Baggs Jackson, the vibraphonist, the bassist Ray Brown, and his old friend from the army, Kenny Clark. They had started playing as a bit of a pickup band in intermissions when the Gillespie band was taking a rest between sets, but soon enough they launched themselves as their own group in 1951, originally as the Milt Jackson Quartet, but pretty soon, largely due to Lewis's very strong influence in the group, as the Modern Jazz Quartet. The Modern Jazz Quartet, or the MJQ, is of course a highly influential group, and the classic lineup eventually emerges, and that's got Percy Heath instead of Ray Brown, who'd gone to play with Oscar Peterson on bass, and Connie Kay on drums instead of Kenny Clark had moved to Paris. And that lineup evolves to be some kind of proto third stream outfit, which allowed Lewis to try and reconcile his two great interests, classical music and jazz. And so trying to provide more form and arrangement to the music, but still leaving space for the improvisation, which is central to jazz. And in that, the work they were doing in the East Coast was not too different from some of the kind of arrangement meets spontaneity work that was happening, uh, led by people like Shorty Rogers and Jerry Mulligan out in LA. Anyway, the MJQ is a whole other story, but its relevance here is that two of its four members are on this record. The other, of course, is Percy Heath, who's about as far away from Lewis as you can get in terms of background. He's no cerebral, classically driven musician. He is a hard swinging bassist from a jazz crazy family out of Philly. This record comes about in part as a consequence of a tour of the West Coast, which the MJQ were doing in February 1956. They were due at the Blackhawk in San Francisco at the end of the month, but before then they had a couple of weeks engagement at Jazz City in Hollywood. 
And Dick Bach, ever the opportunist, as West Coast jazz producers kind of had to be, went to check the MJQ out at Jazz City and approaches John Lewis at intermission and says, look, I've got a project I'd like to do with a tenor sax player who's local, Bill Perkins, who was known to these guys because he played a lot on the East Coast as well. Would you and would Percy Heath like to come and be on a session when you've got an off day in the stand at Jazz City? And Lewis and Heath agreed to do this. To complete the quintet, Bach fills it out with two other players who at the time were contracted to his own label, Pacific Jazz. Chico Hamilton, who was leading his own quintet, and the guitarist from that quintet, a still relatively unknown guitarist at that point, not unknown, but lesser known, Jim Hall. The addition of Hamilton and Hall makes a lot of sense from Bach's perspective, because if you think of the MJQ as essentially the prototypes for the fusion of classical and jazz that was happening on the East Coast, their West Coast analogs were almost certainly the Chico Hamilton Quintet. Both groups in the past had been lauded for, or accused of, playing chamber jazz. Hamilton was a founding member of Jerry Mulligan's innovative quartet in the early 1950s out in LA, and his new quintet, which of course included Jim Hall, also included the cello lines of Fred Katz, and Jim Hall himself, as a guitarist, had studied classical music earlier on. The final member of the group was Bill Perkins, who, if you recall, was putatively the leader of this session, or at least in Bach's mind, but it pretty soon became evident during the course of the session over that afternoon that Lewis's influence was such that it really ought to be billed as a collective effort. Perkins had a CV that was really typical of so many of those West Coast cool players. He'd apprenticed in orchestras run by Woody Herman and Stan Kenton, and then later on in LA had done a fair amount of small group work with people like Barney Kessel and Bud Shank and Shorty Rogers. This record, with the two degrees east, represented by Lewis and by Heath, and the three degrees west, Hamilton, Perkins, and Hall, is made February 10th, 1956, at the Music Box Theater on Hollywood Boulevard in LA. This was the only possible date they could make this record because it was on a Monday, and Monday was the only day that the MJQ had off from their regular engagement at Jazz City before they headed up to San Francisco. Incidentally, the theater is still there in Hollywood Boulevard. It's now known as the Fonda Theater. It's gone through a whole bunch of different incarnations. Richard Bach is a producer, and effectively, John Lewis is, well, at least the co-producer of this, certainly the arranger, because he picks and arranges all the tracks that are played here. There are several different covers of this record. This one is the most beautiful and the best known. There are several different releases which use this cover. I don't know who the model is, but she is lying on the grass, and she's got a copy of a 19th century novel by Herman Melville called The Confidence Man lying askew beside her. Side one starts with Love Me or Leave Me, which starts off somewhat worryingly with a kind of button down, sort of chambery kind of feel, but it soon begins to swing thanks to Chico and thanks to Percy Heath. Perkins here is kind of at the peak of his lyricism in terms of his playing over his career, and to me, his tenor sounds an awful lot like Paul Desmond's alto around the same time. This is a fairly extended track with long solos. I find Chico's solo at the end is a little bit incongruous, but overall, not a bad start to this record. The next track is Vernon Duke's I Can't Get Started, and this, I think, is stripped down to a trio format with Perkins and Hall laying out. This has John Lewis's romanticism on full display. It really is a lovely track. Perkins returns on Easy Living, which is another laid-back but still quite pretty-sounding track and a nice way to end side one. Side two begins with Two Degrees East, Three Degrees West, the title track. Um, this is the track that probably gets the most press off this record. Personally, I'm not sold. I find the main theme a little bit ponderous. This song does get on track when Hall comes in, but I find at every point where it really starts to catch on fire, it then flickers out again, at least for me. Skylark is a vehicle for Hall. Again, a mellow track, but a very nice one. And the final track on the record is Almost Like Being in Love by Lerner and Lowe, and this, for me anyway, is the swinginest and maybe the best track on the record. This is not a record which anybody is going to find too challenging, but the question is, is it too lethargic? And I find it a little ironic that adding a couple of East Coast players with great pedigrees into this mix ends up with a record that probably lacks a little energy relative to some pure West Coast products that were coming out at the same time. Perkins, originally supposed to be the leader, is a little bit underused in this record, which I think is maybe why the record lacks a little fire, missing that tenor sax. If you're going to lead with piano and with guitar, you better find a way to bring it. But unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, nobody tries anything too crazy here. It's a little bit like the MJQ meets Brubeck, though thankfully without the vibes. And for me, it's three and a half out of five stars.